Hello and welcome to the MIT Open Documentary Lab talk. I'm Sarah Wallison. I'm the director of the lab. And today it's my great pleasure to introduce Tamara Shagalu, a prolific director of film and immersive media and founder and creative director of Otto Otto Pictures. Tamara is a grand experimenter who creates projects that represent diverse, unexpected stories, such as a project about the LGBTQ refugees from the Middle East, which is actually part of a larger transmedia series, Queer in a Time of Forced Migration. She's also working with PBS's Frontline on a project called Unresolved, which examines the FBI's efforts to investigate over 100 potentially racist killings, while also illuminating stories of those still seeking justice. She's worked with domes, in domes, with VR, AR, and now has a project, Anushka, that is designed specifically for the team's new interactive platform that they created, Bembe Interactive. Her work is shown at festivals, including Tribeca and Sheffield Documentary Festival, and The Guardian, Forbes Magazine, and Vogue have named her as a leader in the field of new and immersive media. She was a 2018 Sundance Fellow, a 2020 Creative Capital Award recipient, and a 2020 Sundance grantee. Today we'll hear about all of her work with a particular focus on her immersive sound work. Um, and before I hand it over to Tamara, I just wanted to remind people to put your questions in the Q&A section and we will take them after her presentation. So without further ado, Tamara Shagulu. Hi, thank you so much for the introduction, Sarah. Um, all right, I will start. So as Sarah mentioned, um, I'm the creative director and founder of Auto Auto Pictures. Um, I started Auto Auto almost seven years ago, um, and I found the name in a fairy tale book. I really like reading folk tale and fairy tale books from all over the world. And I found I was reading a Yoruba story from Nigeria and I was drawn to this word auto auto, which meant a container of magic spells. Um, and I thought that similarly, I wanted to have a company that contained magic and brought magic to the screen. So that's where the name originates from um, and the root of it. We're an animation and immersive media studio. We work across different mediums, but mostly we focus on animation and immersive media and, um, and have been doing a variety of projects. And I'll focus today on a few projects that are really centered around sound and some of our immersive work that we've been doing. Um, so feel free to visit our website to see more of our work. So as Sarah mentioned today, I'll be talking about harnessing the power of sound and immersive storytelling. Um, I've been thinking a lot about sound and I think a lot of my work over the last two years has been really driven by sound, especially the more I dive into immersive and interactive works. Um, I found this photo while I was preparing for this presentation of me in film school. I went to the University of Southern California for film school and I focused on, one of my emphasis was on sound. So I was trained as a sound engineer briefly and doing, I learned how to mix um, and doing and do sound design. And I think that a lot of my interest in sound and the way that I function as a filmmaker and direct is is often really driven by that that early training that I received and, and when I really fell in love with sound. Um, and I had amazing faculty that really motivated me um, to continue working in it. And while I was in film school, um, I should say that before going to film school, um, I had a past life as an economist. I, I was a Fulbright scholar in, in Egypt and I had spent almost like a third of my life living in the Middle East in different countries. And I got a Fulbright to do research, economic research in Egypt. And while I was there, I became really interested in filmmaking. Um, and when I went to film school um, and I left Egypt, I went to film school, I wanted to make sure to keep, I kept coming back. Um, and I ended up during that period when I was in Egypt, the revolution happened and I happened to have a recorder and decided to travel around with a journalist friend of mine. So this is a photo from when I was in Egypt. And we traveled around the country, like around different parts of Egypt. And we started collecting interviews and just speaking with a variety of people. We decided to focus mostly 
on um, marginalized voices. So we spoke to a lot of different women, refugees who were in Egypt, LGBT communities, ethnic and religious minorities um, around the country. We went to the Sinai, to the north of the country, to the south of the country, to different parts of the country and recorded all of these oral histories and interviews that um, basically related to how people could see the future of the country and after having lived in the middle east for such a long time i'd never seen experience this type of openness when it came to talking about political identity or or thinking or like uh or how people wanted to, to shape their country and i feel really fortunate to have been there during this period with the recorder and but the voices that kind of stood out to me the most and 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 i couldn't really forget were the voices from a lot of like queer people in the queer community in, in Egypt. Um, and, and over the years, I started seeing how there was a sort of pushback against this community um, in particular. And I decided that I wanted to focus on these stories. And I knew that I had a lot of interview material and that a film, putting it together all in a film maybe, would force me to have to cut different things. So I started thinking about looking at interactive media and that was almost 11 years ago. So VR wasn't really a thing at that point. And it was more like looking at the web doc form and I started thinking about different ways. So I started with what I knew, which was making films. Um, and I created the series called Queer in a Time of Forced Migration, which I recently completed. Um, and I started, as I mentioned, I started with the first part, which was the film. And then the second part, which is a virtual reality experience called Another Dream. And the final part, which was originally designed to be a location-based interactive experience called They Call Me Asylum Seeker. And together, these three parts make up Queer in a Time of Forced Migration, which focuses on four individuals from the Middle East and North Africa, um, two from Egypt, one from Saudi Arabia and one from Sudan, and their journeys uh, basically in their search for asylum and safety um, in Europe, in different parts of Europe, in Germany, the Netherlands, and Norway. So the first part that I started with was a film um, and it's grounded in oral history. So I started with sort of my love of sound in a way where I think that even as an economist, a lot of the research that I tended to collect, I always supported it with qualitative research, which meant recording interviews. Um, and people, I knew that people were more open when there wasn't a camera involved. Um, and I was able to pair these oral histories um, with uh, with animation to like bring these stories to life in a way. So I'll share a little trailer of Half a Life. Well, it's very difficult for me to decide if I love Egypt or I hate Egypt. Sometimes I feel like I hate this country, I just want to move out. And this part of the series really kind of focused on the question of what would make somebody want to leave their home and it follows a young gay, gay rights activist in Egypt and sort of his decision of whether or not to leave his home during the revolution and what led him, um, forced him to make that choice. Um, this is like a still from, from the film and, and it premiered at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and has gone on to, to play in different places and continues to tour. Um, and the second part of the film kind of picks up with two different characters, a couple, uh, one's from Egypt and one's from Saudi Arabia, but was living in Egypt and their sort of journey to have to leave um, uh, Egypt and, and Saudi Arabia escape from her family in order to come to the Netherlands and sort of what happens after you make the decision to leave and like if you're really able to make a new place a home and, and what happens, and especially for a lot of LGBT uh, refugees or asylum seekers from the region, they might be escaping some form of homophobia um, and come to countries where then they experience other forms of oppression like racism and, and discrimination for being from the Middle East and how that impacts identity. So this kind of explores that further. And I'll share a little trailer of that. Uh, and this was in virtual reality and I'll go a little bit more into that experience after this.
Hundreds of thousands of migrants have streamed into Europe, the largest influx there since the... They will take over Europe and even the whole world. That's the plan of all Muslim people. Because I don't like it, but it's a, I don't like to be pulled by some Jewish people situation that happened to me. My girlfriend was uh, about to send to Saudi Arabia to get my papers. It was dark, and I feel maybe everything is dark, putting to my hand or her face or anything. Everything was dark. Just hold our hands and just stop work. Dark cold and nothing and no light and no anything. We justified that we are going to work and we are going to work in life. We put our feet on the So for this experience, um, it was once again grounded in oral history and, and these voices. And at that point, over the last 10 or 11 years, I've continued to follow characters. I met most of them when I was living in, in the Middle East and Egypt. And then um, over the years, they become friends. And I just kept recording interviews whenever we would meet up as life progressed and things changed. And as the political situation in Egypt changed and the political situation in Europe um, and, and us ending up uh, I also migrated to Europe myself, so um, we ended up being able to keep in touch. Um, and for this experience, uh, we mixed different types of animation, but um, so visually it was, it was very mixed media in the sense that there was animation that was traditional 3D animation, animation done in, um, in VR, which is drawn and animated in virtual reality, as well as some frame by frame hand painted animation that was drawn to scale to fit in a 360 environment. But what I realized that um, through this experience, I think was how important sound is in immersion. Um, and I think that even in the storytelling or the way that we designed some of the interactivity, um, I should explain that there's a, it's a two person, it was originally designed to be a two person experience. So each person, two people go into the exhibition space or into a headset and they try different versions and they have different endings and they're invited to then discuss it. Um, but throughout the user has to kind of engage. I didn't want people to kind of just be able to go into and experience a sort of what we call like trauma porn in a way where people can just uh, feel entitled that they, they deserve to hear the story, but they have to give something back. So the interaction is connected to Arabic where people have to trace over um, Arabic and learn certain words and together they end up putting together a sentence and they're able to unlock the different chapters in our character's journey. Um, and for me, this language is really important because I started collecting the interviews in Arabic um, when I was living in in the Middle East, and it was the language that the characters fell in love with. It's the language that they speak to their family, and it's a language that is often politicized. So to me, it was important to include it in there. And the one thing I do wish that we had added was a way of hearing the words as well, instead of like instead of just visually being able to trace over it. And um, but I knew that language was very important. And in VR, it's really difficult to have subtitles because um, people there's so much going on. So I had to make the choice to to focus on having English language for broader access, but I did didn't want to erase the Arabic from the experience and including it in there as well. 
And I think that another moment in which we learned how important sound was is through the exhibition. So I wanted to share some images of some of the installations that we designed that go along with the headsets. Um, and I realized that it was really important to be able for creating this sort of immersion or really allowing people to connect to the characters um, and hear clearly what they were saying that we needed to have like noise canceling headphones. So I realized that sound is not only important in the way that you're doing sound design for the project or designing that world, but it's also thinking about how the sound relates to the physical space that you're in. And it's something that I'll discuss a little bit more also in another project that we did, where you really have to think about what the sound feels like in the space when you're doing something that is location-based as well. Um, yeah, so we ended up for some cases like removing these headphones and, and attaching um, noise canceling headphones to allow for more immersion because a lot of these spaces, there's often a lot of people going around and that was something that we had to think about in the planning and design. The final part of the series of Queer in a Time of Forced Migration is uh, They Call Me Asylum Seeker, which I completed this year. And it was originally designed to be a location-based experience that allowed care, uh, audience members to touch the walls and just sit in a meditative space driven by audio. I realized that um, sometimes headsets, uh, even though they create like a one-on-one -on -one sort of individualized experience, um, I wanted to create an experience that allowed people to kind of explore things at their own pace and really feel like they're meditating and not ones with the, the voice and kind of removing the gadgets or the screens that, that can often divide, create a barrier between the voices um, that they're hearing the audio from. Um, so I designed this sort of uh, location-based platform that we were calling a story room that allows people to, would allow people to sit and meditate and t interact with projections on the walls. Um, but then because of COVID, we had to adapt it. And um, I was commissioned by the Documentary Film Festival in London um, to make a digital adaptation of the experience. So we did that this year um, for it, but I wanted to make sure that the audio aspect of immersion was still very present in it. And here's a little earlier trailer that I'll scroll through a bit. Um, to show kind of what we were thinking of with the how the touch wall projections would work and how the environment would be. Um, we leave our countries interacted. because we fear betrayal from our families and friends. So people would be able to kind of explore the room out. to reveal certain because things and be able to have um, individualized interactivity um, tracked by their headphones. Oops. So that was how we originally designed the, the, we're hoping to, to show it. Um, and I collaborated with the Palestinian Syrian Jordanian um, artist who's a good friend of mine and um, who paints a lot of, uh, makes this sort of art that is uh, very grounded in sort of um, uh, refugee themes and, and gender identity in the Middle East as well. And it was really great being able to collaborate with him on this piece for some of the concept art that we then adapted into 3D environments um, and and to make it interactive. So this is one of the images, I don't know if you remember now the image at the beginning, but we adapted it for 3D and in the experience, uh, people go through um, as, a, as a boat um, for the web experience, the user kind of functions as this boat and you're able to interact with certain aspects of the experience. And I should say that this chapter, this part of the story really focuses on kind of what happens like 10 years after the revolution, there's a character from Sudan who joins, um, and there was recent, the recent, uh, reflects on the recent uprisings in Sudan and goes back home for the first time. So it's kind of a parallel of like, how what happens when you want to go back home, all the things that you miss, like he missed the death of his father, for example, or the birth of nieces and nephews. And it ties together the story and shows what's happened from the beginning of the revolution through the end. Um, so this is the version that we just made and it was, it's available online um, uh, as well. It's a web-based experience where people can interact and, and it has some sort of uh, game qualities to it as well that allows the audience to, to play around with that. We also 
recently premiered it, um, the whole series is the first time I exhibited all three pieces together here at the Amsterdam Museum. Um, and because of COVID, we had to make certain adap adaptations to it. So the VR was adapted for a dome. So you can kind of see a dome there to the left of me, um, or I guess my left, you're right, I don't know. <laughs> and then uh, to the other side, uh, if you see there's this triangle sort of shape, uh, there's a computer in there. Um, and because the sound was uh, spatialized and designed to be really immersive for people even experiencing this at home, uh, we didn't want that to get lost, but because of COVID, people couldn't wear headphones. So we designed this sort of insular space that allows people to pop in there um, and experience it and feel like they're, they're having the surround sound effect without having to wear headphones. So it was really challenging, but exciting being able to play with how to adapt showing these sort of individualized interactive experiences to make them broad and permit for social distancing as well. Um, but we were still really excited about the story room concept and creating this sort of experience um, that allows for a meditative space and for interactivity without, um, without the need for, for gadgets or a digital screen. And we're currently working on a project called Anushka, and we decided to create a story room platform um, that we're now calling Bembe. So I'll show you a little teaser of that. So the name Bembe actually comes from uh, a drumming tradition where part of my family is from Latin America um, and it's storytelling tied to drums. And, um, and, we, and I was really excited about the idea of using sound and telling drums um, in drums and, and storytelling and the, the power of sound in, in stories and what it would be like to have sound lead the way with stories when it comes to immersion. So we created the space where the sound is really what drives the immersion um, for interactivity and for this project Anushka that we're working. Um, it's similar to our other work, it's multi-platform. We tend to make things for multiple platforms. And um, this story, I, um, we're working on, a, on an animated version uh, with traditional like animation film for, for, for Netflix with, through a fellowship that I just received. And then the second, the other part that we were doing here in the Netherlands is a location-based interactive version that will be on our Bembe platform. And it basically allows, um, it's a story-driven, um, audio-driven experience where you enter the space and the audience interacts with the story through sound. So the idea um, at the core of the story is that there is this concept that all our stories are sort of intertwined and, and kept in this thing called the braid of time where we're each a chord. So there's a musical theme that goes throughout it. The dialogue is in spoken word. And the idea is that everyone has a song and, um, and sometimes you have to fight to keep your song. And it very much relates to this concept of a, a young black girl in the Netherlands who um, is fighting literal forces that are trying to silence her and how she must tap into her power in order to be able to fight that and keep her song. And to, to help her keep her song, the audience must interact. Um, and it's a four person experience where everyone enters the room and you have different options in which you can interact and have individualized interactivity that you, you have to play a certain role in the story to move it forward and, um, and create sounds basically to activate her powers in the braid of time. So you can either make sounds through, through movement, through touch, by literally singing or saying something. Um, we wanted to give people a variety of options in order to interact with the, with the meaning of what it means to have your own song. Um, so we're currently working on this and we're super excited about it. Um, and it, I was, the idea, I was really inspired by the idea, I think, from living in, um, in the Netherlands where I spent part of my time, well now because of the pandemic, most of my time. <laughs> and I, um, 
and I was really inspired by the history of this particular part of the the of Amsterdam called the Belmer, which was a city that was designed to be. It's a part of Amsterdam, and it was designed to be like a city of the future of the future, and then was deemed a failure in architecture um, because a lot of people who were came from the former colonies and were discriminated against and couldn't get housing in the city center were forced to squat this area and now it's the most diverse part of the Netherlands and I, I think that even though it's been deemed a failure in architecture um, it was actually a success when it comes to the amount of diversity and creativity that comes from this area so I wanted to kind of highlight that part of the ne of Amsterdam and the Netherlands um, and focus on a story of, of tapping into that power that keeps us from being silenced um, so that's one of the projects that we're working on now to continue with the platform and hopefully if the pandemic ends, which we're hoping for, um, we'll be able to share it uh, next year um, on, a, on the Bembe platform and have people join and be able to interact with Anushka and, and her family in the story. Um, I guess continuing my, my sound driven journey, this is like a tour, I guess, through my sound work. I recently, uh, did my first full dome project, um, which contrary to popular belief is not the same as VR, um, <laughs> as, I, as I learned. And I, as I started my talk, um, I, I was really fortunate to, to have some really amazing sound professors when I was in school. And one of them was Tom Holman, who is the creator of THX uh, with Lucasfilms. And I remember him telling us a little bit about the process of doing the sound design for uh for star wars and and how um back then they only had like set libraries so most space movies sounded the same and with star wars was the first time that they were able to to innovate and create completely new worlds just through sound and i was blown away by this but at the same time i was like wow these a few of these dudes have like defined basically what space sounds like in our brains and it's been imprinted and I grew curious wondering if there were other people in other parts of the world who imagine space to sound differently um, so I guess almost like a year and a half ago or something I started just researching space films with some of my my colleagues and we started we decided to start an archive so whenever we would find some movie that was set in space from a different part of the world we would throw it in, a, in an excel sheet and we just kept building and building it up and I'll show you a little bit of the teaser and then I would love to share the archive with you. Um. So I should say that um, after we found this um, this uh, sound, um, these films, we started putting together this archive. Uh, I, I wanted to experiment as somebody who had a background in sound. I was really curious to find out what it would be like to make a film sort of from the sound. Normally you, you do the, you lock picture and then you do sound design. Um, and I was curious to see what it would be like to make visuals based off of sound design. So I created a sonic journey. I, I spent some time listening to these films and, um, and, and working together uh, with my editor in order to find out like what sort of story and if there were themes in the sound design or the design of each part of the world and how they approach the sound design of film set in space from different parts of the world. So we created a sort of sonic journey around the world through sound. Um, and then based off of that, I started designing visuals. Um, and in the making of visuals, I, was, I started learning a lot about the relationship between the stars and indigenous cultures from different parts of the world. 
Um, and then I found that there was a correlation between how indigenous cultures in different parts of the world related to the stars. And I found traces of that in the way that the sound design was made. So in certain parts of the world, there was like more of a fear for space. So the sound design tended to have this like ominous quality to it. And then other parts of the, the, the world, it, it was a sense of time or, um, or the stars were used in politics. And, and you found traces of this also in the sound design, which I found really interesting. So that was kind of the process. Um, and my one of the sound designers who I often collaborate with thought I was crazy because I wanted to do it backwards. And she was like, no, I need a picture to be able to design to. And I was like, no, let's design like a story. Imagine um, it's just a sound and then I will make visuals based off of it. Um, and now I understand because I've done the, pro the process backwards, why it's done just the way it is now. But it was it was a really interesting process and I think it got me even closer to the importance of sound. And I think also when I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the installation and how space, um, you have to think about how sound sounds in a particular space when you're exhibiting your work. In a planetarium, um, I noticed that depending on the number of people, the sound sounded differently. And even though the sound was mixed, the levels are different than in, in movie theaters. And then I also learned that planetariums, each planetarium is, is really different from the next or the other, and they have different sound systems and different projecting systems and they're different sizes. Um, so there's a lot of variables that are involved and because of the pandemic um we knew that we wanted it to have a broader reach so we also made a virtual reality version of it and wanted to create um something that people could just like kind of lay on their floor and escape their rooms or houses since we're all trapped inside and travel through space um, while hearing the sounds of different parts of the world so every sound that you hear in there comes from a film oh, sorry excuse me from a film that is in this archive from different parts of the world and I'll show you a little bit of the archive. Um, I think I have to stop sharing. And then... So if you go to our website, you can read a little bit more about the project, um, different versions, and then you can explore the archive where we put some of these films. Um, from that are set in space from different parts of the world. Um, so it's a very specific category. Um, and then we also invite people to add films. So if you know some, please join. Um, but I invite you to, to explore some of these films and, and watch some of them. Um, I think I have lost. Let's see. And lastly, um, uh, one of the projects as Sarah mentioned that I'm working on now is called Unresolved with Frontline. And similar to the other pieces, um, it's very much grounded in oral histories in particular. Um, for me, at least, um, as a creative director on the project, I was very moved by the stories, the fact that a lot of the, the stories and lives of these individuals um, who in many cases were murdered for, for racially motivated reasons, that their lives and memory are brought back to life through sound interviews, um, uh, oral history interviews with uh, next of kin, or just conversations that were recorded that they partnered with StoryCorps to collect a lot of these interviews. And you hear different generations talking about the impact of a lot of these murders. Most of them happened during the civil rights era and sort of how that impacts multiple generations and this, this cycle of sort of racial terror in America. And for the experience, um, we're still working on it. So I, unfortunately I can't share um, in that many visuals, but it, I was really inspired by the history of, of quilting in African-American traditions um, and how when 
um, African Americans were enslaved. Uh, it was they weren't allowed to read or write or couldn't afford to take photographs. And the only way that um, our ancestors were able to document their lives or family histories were often through quilting. And and when children or families were torn apart or sold to different owners, they would send a quilt, and that was sort of um, you would have a family portrait in a quilt, and it was a way of passing down some spends of history or memory. So pulling from that history. I, um, I, I started working on the design um, and the whole experience kind of allows, has many layers in a way that a, a quilt works and we've woven in different sort of themes where there's a memorial um, that is a forest that is based on sort of the, the duality of, of the tree as a symbol in America where it's often seen as a, it's seen as a sign of liberty um, with the liberty tree, but it's also seen as an, it has an, a dark history, you know, um, from songs like Strange Fruit of, of it being um, a, of this racial uh, terror and oppression in America. Um, so I wanted to play with that theme um, and the quilting theme as well. Um, so we created sort of this quilted forest that allows users to explore it and they're led through sound um, design and they're able to explore and, and kind of end up in different places. And there's also voice interaction in there that allows users to, to interact with it. There's also uh, another component of the, of the project, which is an installation and it's an augmented reality installation where our audience um, are it's a living quilt in a way that exists indoor or outdoors and um, it has the names of all of the victims 152 of them um, right now and uh, users are invited to to our audience members are invited to say the name of the person um, and in a way bring them to life and be able to explore their stories through devices um, so that's kind of where we're at now and, and the role of sound in storytelling as a tool in interactivity, but also a tool in storytelling and immersion as well. Um, and I hope that this kind of gives a lot of examples. Um, I'd love to hear questions and, and discuss more. I just wanted to kind of give a little bit of a background on some of my work and the role that sound has played in that. Um, and I'll end things with this quote from Audrey Tang that I really love um, that motivates me and my work in the way that I see uh, technology as a tool in the storytelling that I'm trying to do um, in hopefully changing the world. Um, so when we see the Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it a collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. When we hear the singularity is near, let us remember that pl plurality is here. Um, so with that, I will leave and feel free to reach out, check out some more of our work. Um, always open to hearing from other people or collaborating. Thank you. Thank you, Tamara. That is beautiful, beautiful work and so poetic. And it's, it's amazing and it's great that you talked about sound because there's clearly so many stories and, and meaning and, and thought behind the sound and yet you've taken by the visuals. So it's, it's a wonderful opportunity to hear that behind the scenes. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our uh, panelists and see if there are any questions. Uh, let's see, does any of the panelists want to? William, I see you with your hand raised. Yeah. Tamara, thanks so much. Really wonderful, wonderful work. And it really made me think <laughs> your days at USC are going to come back here. Th that ancient film theorist, Rudolf Arnheim, who, who was a perceptual psychologist who really who wrote a wonderful book called Film as Art, another great book called Radio as Art, wrote a lot about the different affordances and densities of, of recorded sound and recorded image. And one of his points is that recorded sound really can emulate the real in a way that that the photographic image can't. Photographic image is always flat. Even the VR image is kind of wonky. But sound, you can really, you know, our, our acoustical technologies are, are, are much better. And yet sound also has this amazing ability to be internal. Uh, you, you were mentioning how you were using, you had a scene where the, uh, the, the viewer is invited to meditate a little bit. And I could imagine, I don't know the piece, but I can imagine sound being used very effectively almost to evoke a kind of internal voice. So on the one hand, it's super real. On the other hand, it can be almost subjective. And then there's the image. 
and your images are seem to be pretty much consistently animated images and and i'm interested in that choice and is are you i mean it seems to be a perfect solution to kind of bypassing the realism problem of the image but i'm just curious about that have you tried working with photographic images doesn't it line up with the sound well how do you see the fit between sound and image i guess in, in terms of their densities of realism yeah, I mean, I, I think that I'm, I'm in love with animation as a, as a medium, and it started in particular for queer in a time of forced migration. It was a choice because we had to protect the identity of, of the individuals whose stories we were saying. And as I was traveling around Egypt collecting oral histories, people weren't that open to being on camera. Um, so at that point, I decided to just focus on, on the, the sound of the, the interviews. I do work with live action um, sometimes, but um, I've mostly been working with animation. And I think that animation has a certain power of, sus I mean, all films suspend di the like disbelief, but I think that animation can be really visceral to a different way where um, it, it not only allows you to really see or, or imagine what the person is feeling to a different degree, um, that I think live action does because sometimes live action is kind of trying to imitate life in a way similar to what you were saying where where animation you can really kind of push and take people I think psychologically to a different mm -hmm. different place so I think that that's probably why I'm I'm often driven to animation especially in immersive works because um, I think that in VR you can sometimes really get into that uncanny valley um, area a little bit and 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 sometimes in some live action stuff that I, I saw I felt like I was invading a space um, uh, when I saw live action like re recordings um, rather than with animation I feel like more of a, a guest you can create you're like being invited into someone's memory or play with the theme of memory which I think is something that I explore a lot in my work. yeah great thanks mm -hmm. Carla, you have a question? Um, I love hearing about your work and just your thought process behind each of your projects. It's just beautiful. Um, a question I had is just how do you think through, I guess, issues with like audience, like who you're making the, the your projects for and accessibility, something that I grapple with in my own work with immersive media is trying to get it back to the original communities that I've, um, I guess, documented or recorded. And I'm just curious if you, um, how do you think through that in terms of accessibility and your audience of, of your projects. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's something super important to me also. And um, and for for example, with some of the films, like we always, we, oh, this is gonna be publicly <laughs> recorded, I forgot. But we were able to organize some like secret screenings um, in, in, um, in, in some of the places um, and and it was work, working with local communities or like activist groups to also like have this work be a tool for change as well, um, which is something that was really important to me. Um, and then I tend to also have my work with like public organizations where I think museums sometimes, like I try to see how much community outreach or involvement they have um, and where they bring certain people. So I think museums sometimes are a great partner for making sure that that has access. And with the project that I'm doing with PBS now, that's something that we've been thinking a lot about and including sort of like loner devices in the experience so that people who don't have phones or fancy phones are, are able to access it, um, making things that, so they're in public spaces. Um, I know that that's something that's been really important. And I always try to make like a, a low tech and a high tech version of, of things in a way that doesn't impact um, the experience or it can be a little bit of a different experience. But for example, with the planetarium experience, um, in this case, it was because of COVID that I knew that not many people would be allowed to physically go into the planetarium. Um, but then I also made a version that could work on, on any headset. Um, so people could get it on cardboard and I can mail them. Um, and then people can watch it um, and, and creating, like trying to lower the barriers of entry. So I think with everything that I design, scalability is often. So I try to think of like, what is the easiest way that somebody can access it um, and what are potential challenges to that and how that impacts the design of the experience. Does that answer? Oh, absolutely, thank you. Yeah. Kat. Muted, Speaking of sound, 
Hi, Tamara. Thank you so much for your presentation. And um, I was really curious to hear that you, you talked a lot about oral history as being an important part of your process. Could you, could you elaborate a bit about that and how you see that maybe in relation to the notion of documentary? Yeah, um, I mean, I like my background is as a social scientist. Uh, I studied economics um, and a lot of my research focused on sort of qualitative like research. So I focus on labor economics when I worked in economics and it was mostly about the impact of male migration on, on women left behind and how that um, impacted their economic power and engagement in society. And I found that often when trying to do research for that, the best approach was through oral history. Um, so that's kind of, I think, where I realized how in love I was with stories and even in my work as an economist, that, that was what I found really interesting and, and of course, quantifying that. But um, I think that that's where that was kind of rooted and, and how, what led me into story because I was really familiar with, with collecting oral histories from the academic side of it um, and then going into making documentaries of that. I think it was similar to kind of crafting the oral history to focus on a specific point um, that you want to you want to make. And I like the idea of it's kind of like a puzzle working with existing material to fit it together um, to kind of summarize or share what the whole interview was about. Um, but it's really hard cutting stuff for sure. Yeah. Healthy. Hi, um, thank you so much for sharing everything. It's amazing. I probably have 50 questions, but I will try to focus on one that's particularly interesting to me as somebody who works with sound as well. You talked a lot about um, the interactions that you were you, you you had, whether they're voice interactions or some other kind of interaction with the sound. And I was just wondering if you could, I think you hit on a little bit of that, but I was wondering if you could give a little more detail on some examples of how you how you sort of engage the audience and, and sort of what, what the mechanics are of that. And I mean, is somebody speaking to like, Alexa, do this. I mean, is it, is it that kind of interaction or is it some, something else or, you know, and what is your sort of, what is your goal for this interaction? Is it, is it um, obviously it sort of increases engagement in a, in, in, in a, in a way, but um, I know you talked about like sort of, being helped through a journey in one of your pieces by by interactions, but I just was wondering if you could shed a little more light on some of those details because that's a fascinating area. Yeah, sure. I I think in general when I design interactions, I look at I really try to have them be grounded in the story. So that's normally where it starts for for me. And um, in Anushka, when I was talking about like the concept that everyone is uh, everyone's story or life is part of this cord or this braid of time that we all come together and and the whole history of the world or existence or humanity is kind of woven together like a song has different chords and playing that concept i wanted to i was thinking about what is the role of the audience in in this journey and i thought of them as chords as individuals and and the idea that every chord has a song or everybody every human has a song and pulling the interaction from there. So I wanted to allow people to end the story when interacting or her powers come from this magical chord and allowing people to play the, play a song or actively interact through sound um, felt like it related to the story since it's very sound driven. And there's also like incantations and the use of rhyme and spoken word in the experience. So the sound is, is very important to it and I wanted people to be able to speak um, or relate to it and then um, I was thinking about if people don't feel comfortable speaking, they should be able to make sounds in different ways and we're able to track movement through like infrared sensors so that people can make sounds through movement and, and it's just an input and output experience. Um, so the input you can define however you want and the output can be a sound. Um, so I just looked at it in that way for that experience in particular. And then for, um, for example, for the experience that I'm doing with PBS now, I was, I was thinking about this history of racial terror in America and, and, um, and I was really moved by the Say Her Name movement um, with Breonna Taylor in particular and how this is something that keeps happening um, generation after generation and thinking about if this is about bringing these people to life, how many names um, are there that haven't been said or murders that haven't been solved. And I'm 
in kind of relating to how I think about space when you're doing an installation, I thought that it could create a sort of not only like an awakening or like a chanting of bringing these lives back to life. If you have a room full of people with an installation that invites people to say each different name, 152 of them. And I was thinking about this cacophony of names in a way that it's another way of bringing to life these individuals. So when designing it, so I kind of think about how, what is the relationship between the story, the space that it will, it will be, and what that action could do to support the story. That answers your question. Uh, Nadav, do you have a question? Okay, so uh, thank you for sharing this really wonderful work and, you know, even the different directions like that archive, I'm definitely gonna revisit right after that. <laughs> um, but a question about the, the process of that project. Uh, you mentioned how you took on this like thing of starting from the sound uh, and kind of generating the visual out of that. So um, I, I would love to hear a bit more about that process, like what that process involved or what that was like. That, that's really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it, it was crazy. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie because if you I mean you listen to the to the music to the films and sometimes I would have to listen to stuff with my eyes closed because I didn't want the visuals of the film to impact how I was interpreting the sound so sometimes I would listen to pieces or scenes from a movie with my eyes closed and then try and guess or write down what I felt or what I thought was happening um, and see if it matched with what was visually happening um, and and started just kind of creating like themes or writing down like trends that I noticed in the films by region. So the easiest way to do it was kind of grouping the journey by region. So I, I grouped the films by region um, and then created a journey based on that by like the sounds that I felt related or supported this sort of emotion um, more. It was kind of the way that I, what that we did it. And then my editor were just cutting sound and there's a lot of whooshes and <laughs> and drones and low frequency sounds and then you have to tell the difference like which one is from which movie and where it where it goes and and we still worked with the sound designer on like polishing and placing these because there's still an aspect of like story that that works with even when you're working with archival sound um and also realizing that in a lot of these films music also plays a big role so that was an interesting um, thing of dividing the sound design from the music and then we worked with the composer to like have certain musical elements that pulled from these regions um, as well. So I started, I, I mean the sound was what took us the longest so it was just like sounds and then we just did it, it was a mad rush for animating because um, it took such a long time to like really craft a story just from sound um, and then kind of just sitting with the sound of each space um, doing research on like indigenous knowledge and how the relationship with stars and, and what I had read from there and then designing visuals sort of that alluded to some of the cinema as well um, and, and tied it together with some of this research that I had done. Um, so it's all very kind of experimental and abstract, um, but I think that making a picture and then having the sound come after is definitely easier. And I understand why it's like that now. <laughs> Right, we have some questions from the audience, so I'll read a few of those to you. We have one from Caroline Jones. She says, I'm interested in how you identify and work with artist animators. And is it fair to sense a little Marjan Satrapi in that first film's look and feel? Uh, in general, could you talk about your collaborations for these very different looks in your films? Um. Yeah, sorry, I was trying to find the question in the in the chat so I could also it's in the, read it's it. in the Q and A. Oh, okay. I read from there. Um, oh, nice. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of people say that, and I, I can kind of see um, some Persepolis uh, vibes in there um, and the two D, but it's very mixed. Um, there's also, I also tend to use some archival video in, in my work as well. Um, so in the VR, there's some archival like video, um, in, in, in Half Life, there's also some archival video from the revolution that we like paint over or animate over, um, and very much into mixing mediums and types of animation. So that's something that I 
often do. Um, and for collaborators, I tend to work with like the same um, sort of team, team mostly for, for the animations. And I think that having um, people who relate to the issues that we're exploring um, and the subject matter is really important. Um, so my team tends to be really, really diverse. Um, usually like um, a lot of the people in the creative team and like, um, and, and some of the animators like relate to the subject matter or part of the communities that we're working with. Um, so that's kind of how I identify collaborators um, as well. I don't know if that answers the question. All right, so we have another question from an anonymous attendee. She, she or he says, hi, my question. For a budding researcher and VR filmmaker, what are some important best practices that you have learned along the way, especially making relationships with vulnerable populations? Tyler Musgrove, PhD student at University of Michigan. Oh, that's who asked the question. Uh, so how do you make relationships with vulnerable populations? Oof. I don't know, that's a difficult question because I've, I've usually always had a, a relationship to the community. So um, so a lot of these queer activists in Egypt were my friends and were part of my community when I lived there. Um, so I, I was, it was something that was part that, that came easy to me um, as far as interviewing people and starting to collect audio in that way. Um, and uh, and with PBS um, or with Frontline, the project that we're doing, um, there's journalists who collect the, the interviews and do the reporting aspect. And my responsibility is more of sort of the, um, the visual aspect. So I, I don't, I, I haven't had to uh, really like make, reach out to, to vulnerable populations that I don't have an immediate or personal connection to. Um, so it's, it's really hard for me to, to I think, advise on, on that. All right, we have another question from Hadreza Nasiri. She says, or he says, they say, thank you very much for the great talk. In my experience, 3D sound gives more of a sense of space rather than making one feel in the space. It draws attention to its technology, but more importantly, outside of VR, the lack of a familiar and easy match between sound and image space with a 3D soundtrack in a real space can inhibit the marriage of sound and image for the viewer's perception. I'm curious how you've tried to improve that in the story rooms. I don't think I understand the question, to be honest. Let me read it again. So I think it's the space. I guess the sense of space rather than making one feel in the space. Um, I don't know. I think it depends on how you approach sound design because there's, I mean, depending on what I'm doing, there's different ways that you can approach sound design where you can try and create sound that is more realistic. You can create sound in space that is, is hyper realistic. Like you can play with the levels of realism. And, and I think with sound, that's the importance of the mix where the mixing process is kind of where that aspect of reality comes to life. Um, and with spatialization, for example, with story room, um, you're physically moving and you have individualized sound interactions. Um, so if you touch something like only you can hear it, you can't, somebody else can't hear it. Um, and you're moving in a space. So the, your sense or relationship to the space sonically is changing. Um, versus for example, with the, they call me a sound seeker, which is a web experience um your the user stays in a in an area and you can design the sound or move sounds around them to create the sense of space so i think it the approach to sound mixing um and and how i design sound depends on the space and and as well how the user is moving or interacts with the experience um so i don't know if there's a clear-cut answer on that one And another question from Francesca Sones. Um, so much of documentary is about visualizing memory and making it visible. 
something that I'm interested in conceptually and in my own doc work. Could you talk a little bit more about this? Yeah. Um, well, that's interesting. I don't know if I if I agree so much with the importance of documentaries visualizing, um, but maybe it is in the sense of its documentation. But I think that because my for like my my entry into documentary was through sound and oral histories, um, it wasn't through just the visual aspect. But I was really moved by how to document these stories, um, and and that kind of led my way into um, into documentary. But I do agree that. I think most documentaries are about about this memory or usually it's telling something that's happened in the past. Um, and of course, something unfolds while some documentary things are unfolding while you're recording as well. So there's different aspects. But in my work, it's often been about memory and reflecting. Um, and especially with the Queer in a Time of Forced Migration series, it was about movement through time. Um, but I think I'm really driven um, through the sounds and, and the voices of these stories that I'm trying to tell and how to support those voices with visuals rather than um, capturing the visuals first, I think. William? Yeah, to, to pick up on that, the last you know 20 or so years have been so interesting in terms of uh, how radio has really transformed storytelling, podcasts. And, and now we have a lot of locative sound technologies, um, Bose glasses that let you walk through the streets and, and can be triggered by, um, by, by sound um, assets. Are, is there stuff out, A, is there, are, are there things out there you're watching and excited about? And B, is there anything that's tempting you to sort of abandon the image and just go for the sound in the world? I, I think I'm still very much like a, a visual person um, and but I, I am waiting for someone to make um, a headphones that can be, I mean, there's a few companies now that are playing with headphones that have individualized tracking because we've kind of had to like jerry-rig it or like make it ourselves um, in some ways, but be nice to have somebody with like a more of an engineering background to make professional headphones that allow for these sort of individualized um, experiences through headphones that can interact with one another and track one another. Um, and I've, I've, through the research and process of like our story room platform, um, I've met with different researchers and people who've been trying to work on this, but it's something that's still in, in progress. And that excites me. I think that will like open up even more opportunities for, for immersion in ways that sound can, can, can support that, um, in interactivity, um, as well. Speaking of different platforms, so this Bambi, this Bambay platform is, tell me, tell us more about that. Is that something that is going to be, you know, also we're in this time when a lot of different online platforms are being created. Um, is that something you see being used by others for other projects? And why did you um, see the need or have the need to create a new platform for your project? Yeah, I mean, I spend a lot of time in a headset. <laughs> I think that after a while, I was like, I want to be immersed without having to go into a headset. And I started, that's where I started thinking about what are ways to do that. And, and it was kind of take breaking apart, like, okay, we can do this. And we still use like some aspects of trackers or different systems that work in VR but trying to remove the gadgets and allow these spaces to just be kind of like meditative and to really like let people so interact when they want to without it feeling forced, um, but maintaining them feeling immersed. And I, I was just so moved by how powerful like sound is in VR in particular that I didn't want to lose that aspect. And that's kind of what led us into this. And ideally I would love to, like, we've been talking to some other filmmakers and creators and, and artists and like supporting them and providing like the technical support um, with my team to help support their stories and storytellings and, and we really wanted to be something that can be adapted to different stories and it's very moldable and like malleable so that um, that anyone can 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 use it in different ways um, and and have like this sort of immersion through sound or it can be more visual and interactive. Um, it's pretty open. 
Uh, so we would love to, to, to allow other artists to use it as well. Um, so much invention happening <laughs> in one place. Um, does anyone else have any questions? I don't see any more in the audience. Is there any other further comments from any of the panelists? Um, see, not so. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tara. This it's incredible what you've done, what you're doing. Beautiful, beautiful work. I'm, I'm speaking for everyone here. Um, and thank you for joining us. And thank you to all the panelists and to the audience for being here. This is our last session of the semester and a wonderful way to end. Um, and we'll see you back in February. Thank you.